Welcome everyone back to Fun with WebGL 2.0. And in today's lesson, we're going to start dealing with lighting. And we're going to explore something called the Fong lighting model. So instead of doing a long explanation in the beginning, uh, how about we just jump into the code and I'll try to explain along the way. Since all the lighting actually happens in our fragment and vertex shader, let's start by preparing everything that we need to get to that point. So one of the first things we're going to do is open up our math.js file and we're going to start adding a new object to our library and we're just going to call it MathUtil. And for now we're going to add a new function called the map class or sorry, the map function. And what the map function does, it takes one range of numbers and converts it into a different set of numbers. So if I want to have, if I have a, a range between negative and one, and I want to convert it to 0 and 1, this function will actually help me do it. Um, I have a nice, weird explanation in the comments, but that's pretty much the gist of what this um, math function will do for us. Next thing we're going to do is open up the object loader.js file. And we're going to add a new option into our dom to mesh function. And we're going to have a parameter called keep raw data. And all it does is saves the raw array information for our mesh. So this way we can kind of use it for debugging and uh, maybe for modifications. Um, I was using this to actually help debug normals and, and points and everything else. So having this option there when we need to actually keep the information is very helpful uh, if you really need to um, you know, debug some of your objects. After that, we're going to create a new file called debug.js file. Now this is going to have um, two classes, but for now we're only going to have one. Uh, the other class is called uh, line debugger, which I use for normals, but we don't, it's not really needed for this lesson. Uh, for the next lesson, which we'll probably deal with terrain, that's what I actually used it for. But for now we're going to ha have this one, the vertex debugger. And we're actually going to use this to actually animate a point in space um, to help us um, determine where the light source is. Because light does not really exist. It's not something that exists in WebGL or in any context. It's kind of like um, the camera. The camera is just an abstract idea. So since light is just an abstract idea and we don't have anything to kind of tell us where it is, we're going to use the vertex debugger to kind of show us where the light position currently is. So we're going to start with this class called the vertex debugger and we have our constructor. Um, it has, it's a traditional regular stuff. It's kind of being treated like a model. That's why it has its own transform. So we can kind of move the, the model around. And then um, in there we have a function called add color. All it does is save um, an array of colors that we can push into uh, our shader. And the, it's kind of like one of the previous lessons where we kind of save the fourth component of our, our uh, vertex position as an index for a color. So we're doing that exact same thing. So the vertex debugger basically saves our x, y, z coordinate and then the f w coordinate. We actually just store um, the index position of the color that we're passing in. So add color, is that's all it does. It just adds a color um, to our list that we're going to pass as, an, uh, as a uniform. Uh, if we scroll down, we're going to have an add point, and that's pretty obvious. We're just adding our points to our array. And then we have add mesh points, and that's really like why we're saving um, uh, in the previous change with an object loader, we're saving the index information. So this way when we, when we pass in the mesh, mesh object, it can then actually go find the a vert array that's inside of it and just make a copy of all the data and push it into this debugger object. Uh, if we scroll down some more, then we have create shader. And this object is self-contained. So the shader code actually lives within this object. So this way it's, you know, we don't have to deal with, you know, two things anymore. This is all self-contained. It all handles itself. I'm going to end up doing a lot of things like this um, moving forward. It just self-contained objects with its own shader code. So, you know, we have our um, vertex shader, you know, which has all our uniforms um, that we're used to by now, and, and it has that color array in um, online 183. Um, so it's really, no, there's nothing too, 
you know, we've done this before, just kind of like stuff from the original first lesson where we're moving uh, vertexes around. That's really what this DWG is, really back to lesson one and two. Um, if you scroll down, we have our fragment shader at the top. Um, then we have all our uniforms. We're grabbing all the uniforms. We're kind of, I'm kind of doing this kind of like the old way of doing it. Uh, you know, instead of having all our functions that pre that helps build all this stuff, I'm just going back to the bare bones of GL and pulling out all the information. And then, um, then by line two twelve, that's when we start pushing our color array in there. Um, you know, it's just regular GL stuff that we're doing with shaders. And then we have our finalized function. Finalized function answer after we put it, push in all the data and we set up all our colors. Uh, this one kind of just creates the final buffer that and we push all the data to the GPU and then we create our shader uh, for us. So it kind of just like finalize. This is kind of like a one-time use um, debugger. Um, maybe down the line this object will be changed where the buffer will get replaced at every frame. And then maybe it lives like as a global object as a debugging, an actual really good debugging tool. But for now, it's we just need to do one frame at a time, or just one frame worth of information, and just just re-render it over and over again. Uh, and then uh, we scroll down some more. We have our render function, and all it does is render everything. This is uh, again, this is stuff we've been doing. Uh, probably should don't bother explaining too much. It's, it really just like I said, it goes back to lesson one and two, um, doing it one bit at a time. Uh, the only difference you notice here is that I'm not using VBA, uh, VBA uh, sorry, uh, vertex buffer objects. No, sorry. VBAs, I think. I'm sorry. It's VBAs. I'm not using VBAs. I'm just using nothing but uh, VBOs in this thing. So that's why there's more lines of code here because there's no VBA set up. VAO. Sorry, it's VAO. Ver vertex array object. I am so sorry. It's really late right now, and all these acronyms like confuse the hell out of me. So, um, so yeah, and this is the render function, and that it, it's like our regular re regular shader render functions, and that's pretty much all it, it is to our debugger. So let's all move on to our HTML page. Now at the top we have. Uh, a couple of new uh, JS files that added to the page. We have our debugger.js file. I have a sky map and a grid floor. Uh, the sky map and grid floor is our previous lessons that I kind of just took out and made them into uh, self-contained objects with their own shader code and everything else. Um, so you, if you if you're following along and you um, you still have the regular a sky map and fl grid floor you can keep using it it's fine or if you want you can go to github and just download uh, my new js files um they're really just the exact same code from the lessons that just everything's been packaged into one neat little file so you know that's some of the main changes and then like at lines 26 and 27 uh, i have the new some new variables uh global sky map global Grip floor, uh, M debug, and M debug line. Uh, M debug is for our vertex shader that we're using. I have line in there, but you can, you can save that for the next lesson. Um, so if we scroll down some further, um, you'll see some of our changes. Uh, you'll see our, our sky map, uh, my new sky map uh, object you can get from GitHub. Uh, a quick way of how to um, get everything all set up and ready to go. Uh, the grid floor. It's very easy, quick setup. It's a single line of code. Um, uh, by line, like 57, uh, I sh you probably previously should be commented out, but now I'm commenting it, uh, you know, taking it the comments off of it. Um, so because we're gonna do we're gonna do lighting with the cubes first because uh, certain strengths work really well on cubes and. Um, when we're dealing with our pirate model, which we, at the very end we're going to light the pirate model, a lot of the strength values need to be brought down dramatically. So this way it, the model doesn't become this pure white thing because there's so many uh, vertex and triangles and so many different um, normals that the lighting has to be different for a model compared to a cube. So just to make things simple so you can really see how the lighting really works, uh, we're going to deal with the cube for now. So. Uh, make sure the G model is uncommented, 
and the G model 2 is commented. So this way we're only dealing with one for now. Um, so let's scroll down some more. And uh, under that we have the debug code that we're going to be using. And this is really just going to be our um, fake light source. So we can kind of see it visually um, in our uh, canvas. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, we start off, we pass in our GL context. We tell it how big we want our vertex to be. It would be like, like 10 points big. Uh, we add our color, which I pick red, and I put created a point on origin, and I finalize it. So this way it creates our buffer, creates our shader, does everything that, all the fun stuff. So we're going to continue on, and um, underneath we're going to start adding some new variables. Um, this is kind of at the global context, but this is just really just to handle some animation. Um, we're going to animate our light around our object, and we're going to animate it where it circles around the object, and it moves up and down. So it's kind of like a spiral animation. So the radius is what kind of circle it animates at from the origin. Uh, the angle it keeps track of the current angle of the light uh, in that um, rotation. Um, angle ink is by um, how fast to move in a circle uh, per second, because we're going to use DT to um, an help animate it. Um, and then we have Y position and Y position ink. It's the same thing, the current position in the Y direction and how to increment it per second. And then in our unrender uh, callback, you know, we have uh, like back at line 89, how to, how to render the sky map and how to render the grid floor. It, uh, it's ni nicely and neatly put together. Then in line 94, we start to write all our code to animate the, the motion of our uh, light source. So um, line 94 is we're just incrementing. You know, like I said, it's uh, per second. We're using date time coming from the render loop. Uh, we add do the white position, and then by line 47, we start to calculate our x and y z uh, position based on our angle uh, and and stuff. So um, the x and z is a your regular. Um, uh, cosine and sine uh, trigonometry functions. And then uh, Y, uh, use our new map function to um, map the values, because sine creates a, a value between negative one and one. And I want to map it to a value between 0 0.1 and two. So I, I wanted to go very close to the grid of the floor without going through the floor. And I wanted to go up as high as two units. And then, um, then we take all that information and we push it into our debugger's transform position values. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit more, uh, we'll see there's some couple of changes to our uh, regular shader. Um, we have on line 106 a new function we're going to add in a few in a minute. Uh, set camera position because uh, so, we're going to need the position of the camera uh, to do some lighting. And um, set light position, which is MD bug. MD bug, it's treated like a model class. So it's going to go into the transform and get our position information. And then um, we have our render model, the G model. And as you see, it's uncommented for G model 2. So later on, we're going to comment out G model and put back in G model 2. So this way we can see our pirate when we're ready, and go, ready to go. And then at the end of our unrender function, we have um, line 103, or sorry, 11.3. And it's just rendering our uh, debugger. And we just had to pass in our camera. So moving on, we're going to start modifying our uh, test shader. And st starting at line 124, we're going to start bring, you know, getting references to some of our um, uniforms that we have in our new shader. So we're going to have a light position the cam position and the normal matrix. We need uh, the normal matrix because um, our models are going to have normal uh, direction values assigned to each vertex. And that helps determine um, what direction light should kind of be shining on. And uh, when we're rotating and uh, moving things, we need to also move the, the normal values, the normals. But the normals can't be moved with the regular matrix. Uh, they need to be. There's a special matrix that has to be put together, that um, 
I forget what the it's one is like transpose you have to transpire and then doing an invert um thing. I think that's the exact uh, words for it. Um we there's a function that we have in our math class that we put in the previous lessons and we have it all pretty pretty much set up already for it. Um but you know that's something we need to add to our calculations because if we don't um we're gonna really mess up lighting when we move objects um past you know we start rotating objects and things like that so the normal matrix is very important um so what else we got we got at line 135 we have our, some new functions or our set light position and set camera position um just regular stuff so we we'll move on some more and if we go to near the end we're going to override our render model from our shader so in this thing we're going to um the only thing you know the only thing we're going to add on to it is really just to get the models normal matrix so if we move and rotate the model itself we actually can do the same thing to our normal matrix uh, our normals for that model and then we call super that render model because this uh, shader extends uh, our shader base class. So, like I said, we're overriding the 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 supers render model, adding some extra lines of code, and then we're going to call it again. So that that's the all the changes for our test shader we're doing for now. Now, if we scroll down to our vertex shader, um, so here's some of our new stuff that we're going to deal with. Um, we have tons of uh, our regular uh, matrix. You know, we have our uh, projection, model view, camera. Now we have our normal matrix, and we're going to pass in our camera position. And we're going to have some couple of a uh, couple of things being pulled out um, into our fragment shader. We're going to um, uh, do v position, v normal, and v camera position, and v uv. So it's we're just setting up a bunch of variables for our fragment shader so like if we start line 196 we are taking our models position and multiplying it by our model view matrix so this way we can rotate and move the model um, the reason why we're doing it this way is because we need to reuse this position more than once for other things so we might as well just calculate save it to a variable and then reuse it instead of you know just duplicating it in a couple of places and um, when we're doing this, when we're using the model view matrix onto our position, we're putting our position into world space. Uh, it's because you remember it all all the vertices exist at around the origin, like where they originally um, belong when they were created. And now we're going to move it. So when we move it, it be, now it's it's called world space instead of local space. Um, so at line 196 or 97, we have our position, and I kind of save the x and y z coordinate to our um, out variable that's going to the fragment. Then we have um, our v normals, which multiplies by our normal matrix that we got from the model. Again, this is this this one screwed me up for a couple of days because I did not realize that I had to apply the matrix to the normals because my lighting was really bad. Um, you know, one you know. That's one of the things that really screwed me up was the normal matrix. And another thing that really screwed me up was there in line 200, where I have to move the camera position into world space as well. Uh, that one screwed me up the, the worst. It, it really took me a while to uh, realize that was a problem. Like I was reading tons of tutorials and looking at codes, and I think once or twice that mentioned things had to be in world space, but in the code they did not do it. So I kept messing up, and when I kind of just after a while I just tried it. I was like, oh, let me move, let me tr figure out how to move camera into world space, and that actually fixed up my spectral lighting right away. So this is this is one like probably the most important things you really need to know about lighting is that make sure everything is in the right space. Um, everything has to be in world space or in local space it's one or the other you can't have a mix if it's mixed you're going to mess uh, up your lighting so um, I read that most often you're going to do everything in local space uh, but since I was doing everything in uh, world space to begin with um, I that's why I did this in um, 
I did it this way. Because uh, right here, if you notice on line 200, I'm doing an inverse of the camera, camera matrix. But if if you remember correctly, the camera is the exact, is the inverse anyway. So we set a rotation and a position of our camera. And when we actually bring it into our shader, we do an inverse of it. So the inverse, you know, instead of moving things to the left, it moves things to the right. But we want to make the camera position into world space. So I got to inverse the inverse. So this is so it's probably better off me actually doing all this in local space and not having to do this extra math. But since I kind of was stuck doing things in world space for now, this is why it's it's the way it is. So I'm just inverting our camera matrix and then multiplying by our camera position so we can bring it into a world space so we can add it to our um, position and normal and our UVs. So then we just end the vertex shader on line 203 and you know we a regular you know projection and a camera matrix and our position that we created in uh, 196. And that's our vertex shader. Now we time to start moving on to our fragment shader. So in our fragment shader, we have uh, our texture that we're going to use later on. Uh, we're loading up the pirate uh, skin. Uh, we got our loot, our light position. So we uh, the little pixel that's being moving around, and then we got our all our ends from our uh, vertex shader. So now we're going to the first thing we're going to do is deal with ambient light. That is the first step of the Fong lighting model. There's like three steps. So the first step is ambient, and the idea is the world is dark and there's, the world is not going to be completely diverse or devoided of light. So there's always going to be a little bit of light bouncing around. So that's what ambient light is. It's all about just this very low light ambient light that just exists in, um, you know, so it's not a complete darkness. So, um, so on line 222, we have C base. That's our color base. That's the main color that we're going to be using. Uh, as you see, I have texture commented out. So this is, again, this is for later on for the pirate. But for now, we're going to color our cube by using this color. Then the next line, 223, we have our color light. And our light is going to be white. Um, if you want to experiment, you can try changing color to green and red and see how it all turns out. But for now, we're going to deal with white as our, our light color. Um, then at, at line 127, we just determine the strength of our ambient strength, uh, our ambient light, like how strong is the actual light. And um, it, it, right now it's hard-coded, and ideally you would want to add this stuff as um, uniform values that you bring in. But for now, for, for test, for, for prototyping, this is how we're going to do so we don't have to deal with so many uniforms. We're just going to hard code some of our strength values and our light color and our base color and everything else. A lot of these will be just lots and lots of uniforms that you have to pass in. So for our ambient color on line 228, we just have our ambient strength times light. So it, all it is, it takes our um, vector 3 value of light, which is all 1s, and do a multiplication of 0.5, which essentially turns white into this very, very dark gray color. That's all it does. And then when uh, we go to line 223, we then multiply our ambient color to our base color. What it's basically doing is that the, our light color becomes kind of like a percentage. It tells us how much um, of the actual base color we want to be able to see. So you got to remember, in, in a couple of lines ago, we're, we were doing like uh, one multiplied by 0.15, which results into 0.15. And if you're going to um, deal with that as a percentage value, that's like 15%. So let's say if the if the color is red and we say we want 15% of the red band, you're going to get 0.15 of red. Uh, if the green band is it's at 50% of the red, so you want 25, you want 15% of that. So it, that's what we're really doing. We're just trying to chop off the percentage of the actual color. And if you ever did painting and stuff like digital painting before, uh, probably not, but 
a lot of times in painting, like it's in, 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 like digitally painting, you kind of start off with darkness. You kind of start painting in all the shadows, and then you start painting in all the lighter colors. So you kind of you go from dark to shadows, and that's what we're doing with the Fong lighting model. We're start we're we're going to start by building all our shadows. So once we have our shadow, basically our ambient light set up, and if you go back to the browser and start finally rendering, this is you'll see. You'll see our cube, and it's it's darkest color. This is what how much light is in this world. It's very, very dim. And you'll see our little red pixel there. Uh, this is just a still shot, um, but it, it's, it'll rotate around. So... But this is really this is it. This is what ambient light is. If with if we didn't have that fifteen percent, that cube would be actually black. So that is the first part of the Fong lighting model. Now we're going to move on to diffuse light, and diffuse light is based on the direction of the light and the normal that's attached to the vertex. So in this my little crappy uh, text art, um, we have the X, and the X is the pixel that we're currently rendering in our fragment shader. And we have a normal direction that's on the face that the pixel, the triangle that we're trying to render. And then we have a light source that exists in its own space in world space, its own place there. And what we want to do is determine the angle between the normal and the direction from that pixel to the light source. So as, as it's illustrated, it, um, the light source is kind of like at a 45 degree angle. And at that point, it's going to get half the light source strength. Um, so the idea is to use uh, a dot uh, dot product uh, of our two positions. If, if we get to determine the position between the pixel and the light source and normalize it, and then just use our normal, which is already a normalized value of direction, and we get the dot product between the two, it gives us a number between negative one and one. And um, the closer you get to zero, the closer you get to the two directions being um, parallel with each other. That means they're the exact same direction. Um, once the dot, uh, the dot product of the two angles are at zero, then the light source is directly above the pixel. Um, you can think about it as like high noon and you're looking up at the sky. That's when you have the least amounts of shadows. That's where all the light is. That's where it kind of feels hotter. So that's that's what we're doing. We're trying to figure out where is the light source compared to this pixel. And if it's if it ever reaches one or negative one, it's like perfectly, perfectly perpendicular. That means absolutely no light is touching the surface. It's kind of like the photons are flying right past the surface instead of hitting the surface. So that's what we're doing with um, diffuse lighting. It's just determining the angle of the light that's bouncing off of it. So if we go back to our code, um, there's here's our new diffuse stuff. Um, at line 232, uh, that's when we determine our light direction, the, that, you know, that 45 degree angle in a previous uh, image. And then the next thing we do is get that value between negative one and one. Um, the only difference is here, we're here, we're, we're kind of constraining the, the range between zero and one, because if it's, if, if, if the dot product is like in, in the negatives that we can't have a negative light we can't get any blacker so um we should kind of just clamp it to zero so the maximum value would be anything greater than zero or zero so that's what diff angle is and then we hard coding our diffuse strength like how much of our diffuse strength you want really want to apply to it and then um we just, it's the same thing as ambient. We take our uh, the strength and our angle uh, multiplied by our light. And then if at line 247, you see we have our ambient color and our diffuse color, and we're just adding them up. So that's we just start compounding our light. So we have the ambient light that's kind of just bouncing around. Then we have our um, light source, kind of our light bulb that's hanging around, that's rotating that plus the ambient light 
you know, multiplies our um, color. So once we start compounding light, we might end up having like a, a value greater than one, which would then increase our base color. Where when we're doing ambient color, we're actually decreasing the color. We might, end, you know, and now at this point, now we're compounding light. We're going to increase the color to the point that we the the C base can actually become pure white. So if we go back to our browser with our diffuse lighting, you'll see that um, as the light you know, rotates around the cube, you'll see it's shining um, each side. So this is what diffuse is. It's just a regular nice light that kind of just um, tells you where the light source is. Looks nice. Looks it works out pretty well here. Now we're moving on to the final step of lighting. It is now the specular light. Specular light is the light source in relation to the camera. Um, this one's different because if you ever see like something shiny and you see like uh, certain parts of an object being like very bright or like coming, coming white, that's what specular light is. It's the extra shiny part of the light that's being shined. And the way it works is basically the light ricocheting off the surface. It's a reflective light. Uh, kind of like if you shine light, uh, like a flashlight into a mirror or a laser into a mirror, it bounces off of it and goes somewhere else. That's what we're trying to accomplish here. We're, we're shooting light into like a mirror and we're trying to get its reflective bounce. Um, so that's really the whole point of specular lighting. It's like the, the, the closer we get to the same angle, of light as the camera. Like if the camera is at 45 degrees and the light source is at 45 degrees, then we're going to get the maximum uh, source of light um, apply, uh, applied to the model. So that is really the whole gist of it. And I kind of have another example here. If you like, if you're shooting a bullet into a steel wall, it's going to ricochet. And you know, if you get the right angle, you're going to hit somebody with it. So but I actually kind of like my laser idea because that's more pertained to how light works. So uh, if we move back to our code, we're going to have our final setup, which is our specular lighting. And uh, specular lighting kind of has a couple extra settings. Like at line 148, we have our regular strength. And then at line 49, we have our shininess. Um, sh the, the shinier it is, the more it makes kind of like this very fine light uh, and in one specific spot and the smaller it is kind of the more the light is spread out um, when we're dealing with the pirate model we're going to spread out the shininess um, so it looks better because if you know uh, you'll you'll see in a little bit so that's what really specular shining is um, you know with the with when you're dealing with the cube, uh, experiment between one and two fifty six, and, and do kind of like the power of two. You know, do two, four, um, eight, sixteen, thirty two. You do it like that. You'll you'll see the different layers, uh, levels of shininess that you can apply to it. We're gonna kind of start at the really high end, so you can kind of see see it really well on a cube. Um, if you do it on a model, it, it's just gonna be, you're just gonna make the model pure white. It's it's no point. But in certain things, it'll work. You know, you you have to experiment uh, with specular lighting uh, based on the model. So um, yeah, after that, we get our uh, camera direction. You know, kind of like how we did before for diffused. We got our uh, direction to our light source, and then we use a function, which you know I tried to read up about it, but it kind of it it just kind of helps you get the reflective direction of the light source um, compared to the normal. So it kind of uses the normal kind of like a pendulum, I guess, to help uh, determine how where how it should bounce. Um, so if the reflective bounce is close to what our camera angle is, the better. Um, and that's how, and then in uh, line 253 is kind of like how we apply the, how we apply it. So it's kind of like si similar to how we did um, our diffuse lighting. We use the dot product of our, our, our two directions. And um, then we're going to use the power, which is the power symbol. And we just apply how much 
extra strength to add to it. Kind of, the, you know, like I said, it's either concentrates the light into one spot, like very brightly, or it spreads out the light and makes it, it's a light, lot dimmer. It's, you know, it's like, it's, it's a, I would probably would call it, instead of shining, this is more of a focus. It's, it's a focus setting. Like, how, you know, how focused is the light? That's probably what, how I would really call it, you know, but in tutorials, they've been calling it the shiny uh, setting, but I, maybe it's better off calling it the focus. Um, and then, you know, line 240, uh, 254, you know, we just strength, uh, the, how powerful the light is or how focused the light is, and then by our light color. And then at line 258, um, you again, like I said, you just, just com compound all the light sources together and then multiply by our uh, base color. So if we now move on back to our browser, you'll see um, our light source moving around, and then you'll see like this focused light bouncing off the the, the surface of the cube um, and that's really uh, at because it's 256 if you can you can make it higher you can make it more focused and if you bring down the value you'll actually see it being less focused and just brightening up more of um, the cube and that is the three um, set you know those are the three parts of uh, fong lighting um, so yeah, now how about we start uh, setting things up so we can uh, render our pirate. So if we go back um, to our fragment shader, at line 248 and 249, we're going to decrease our strength and our shininess. That's uh, very important. So it's, it, will, it will make our model look pretty decent. And if we scroll up uh, around line 108, uh, where we have our uh, shader in our render, uh, callback function. Uh, we're gonna on, we're gonna comment out the cube, which is G model, and we're gonna comment back out uh, G model two. Um, so this way we can render our pirate character. And if we go up some more, uh, where we set up our, our models, you know, we comment out G model, which is our cube, and uncomment our G model two. And um, Oh yeah, if you scroll back down, I totally forgot, um, back into a fragment shader on line 222, um, change our C base color into the texture of the pirate. And uh, that'll be all. And um, so all you have to do is now go back to the browser and uh, there you go, you see our pirate girl um, being lit up by our rotating light source. And that is, that's it. And you've now have um, this well lit character that's in the middle of space, standing on a grid floor, and uh, you know it's 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 kind of nighttime. The the moonlight is out. You know it'd be kind of great to put the light source where the moon is, and then you kind of have a really more accurate um, view of the scene. So. Um, yeah, this is this is pretty neat. Uh, it took me a while to do this tutorial because um, uh, I just kept messing up uh, our, the spectral lighting because uh, I, I just I was not understanding or just screwing up the math. Um, so hopefully I didn't screw you guys up either. Um, hopefully you guys are learned, you know, understand. You had a pretty good grasp of understanding of what how this lighting is. Uh, I'll probably post them. Um, links to some of the tutorials I kind of went through that probably do a much better job of explaining it than the probably I did um, so yeah I hope you guys are enjoying yourselves uh, hopefully in the next lesson I will do uh, terrain I already prototyped it and I already have a nice terrain being generated um, so that that's hopefully will be the next thing then after that, uh, probably start moving on to web VR, uh, or maybe I might stick around. Uh, maybe do some type of uh, other textures. Maybe there's bump mapping, uh, and uh, that we can add to the pirate girl. And um, so yeah, so uh, see everyone in the next lesson. This has been a long one. Goodbye.